Okay, good morning, everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on tackling your tenancy questions. My name is Lynn Smith. I'm a Senior Community Education Officer with the Residential Tenancies Authority, and I've been here for about 16 years in two areas in the education and previously in our dispute resolution area. I have 35 years experience dealing with all things tenancy laws and the rental sector, including agents, landlords and tenants. Today, I'll be assisted by my colleague, Valentina Demosca. She's also in our communication and education team. She's sitting in the background at the moment and will come on board to assist with our question and answer time. So thanks, Valentina. Before I do start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are holding today's webinar and where you are also joining us from and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So today's topics, we're going to be looking at um, mould, who cleans mould and also who does maintenance. I'll cover off on a few key sections of the legislation. We'll also address routine inspections, why these occur, how often they can occur, and also remind you a little bit about storm season. Hey, it's just around the corner. And then we'll have some time for your questions. Also, just a small disclaimer there, the RTA cannot provide you with legal advice, and you are encouraged to seek your own independent advice to make informed decisions. Okay, for everyone who may have joined us previously, um, you'll know that we also want to hear from you today. So our webinar will also include some polls um, and I'll get that one, I'll get one of them started shortly. So we'll have a question and answer session before the webinar does finish. We'd love to receive your questions. So what we ask is that you please use the little chat function or that little speech bubble that you see in your Zoom bar rather than the Q&A box, you'll see the image on your screen. We want to also hear from you today on how today went and importantly, what future topics you would like to know more about. Uh, today's topics, besides being regular topics in our call centre and our dispute area, has also been put together because we have received your feedback in this forum on the topics that you want more information on. So please stay on after the webinar finishes and complete the survey. Um, look, it takes less than one minute. Okay, so let's get started. Um, what we're going to do is actually find out who is in our audience today, uh, which rental group you um, belong to, and also where you're joining us from. So just bear with me, I'm just gonna start a poll. Okay. Um, if I can get you to um, complete the poll for us, what we're looking at is what area are you joining us today from? And importantly as well, um, which group do you identify within the rental sector? So what we're looking at is whether you're a property manager or an agent, an owner or a tenant, or whether you're in the rooming accommodation side of things as a provider or even a caravan park manager. So a big special hello to our regional viewers and thanks for joining us today. I think the great thing about webinars, you can join from anywhere. We've, so we'd also acknowledge too that some people joining us today is going to have various levels of experience. So from beginners to people who've probably been managers for quite some time. So we have that today, you'll learn something or use it as a refresher. Okay, I'll just leave that poll going for just a moment. Looks like everyone's just about finished. So it looks like the bulk of people in today's webinars, uh, today's webinar is around the Brisbane and Southeast Queensland. But as I said, um, we've got people from North and Central and West Queensland as well. And we also have an interstate, um, so welcome as well. And the majority of people joining us today are property managers or agents and landlords. Although we do have um, some community housing providers as well as tenants joining today's session. So thank you, everybody. I'll just end that poll. Okay. So let's kick on with our first topic, which is mould. So let's assess the situation first before determining who's going to be responsible to clean it. So let's just take that step back and look at some facts first. We need to be asking the what, where, when, why, and how the mould appeared in the first place to determine who's going to clean it. And every situation can be different and should be treated on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's have a look at some scenarios um, for the rental property first. So what area has been um, affected? 
Also, how severe is it? Is it early days and it's only a small area? If it's really early, you can probably get in early, help control it. The treatment may be small and simple. Has it been caused by water leak or moisture? As example, if it's a roof leak, then this would fall to the owner to repair the um, roof and also then look to treat and clean and deal with the mould. Um, has the mould appeared because of a recent natural disaster or from storm flooding? Again, this would fall back to the owner. From recent um, floods or storms, what we do know is that people do want to work together to get the job done. So we welcome both owners and tenants to do this together, particularly in stressful times just after a natural disaster. People need, need to come together to try and be able to get things done. Um, now from an internal or different type of flooding, so let's say um, we're looking at the tent's washing machine, say the hose is burst or that there's a leak in the washing machine. Assuming, um, that again, that that's caused water damage to the property um, and it's resulted in some mould, say, on the laundry wall, well, that would then be for the tenant to rectify. Um, if there's ventilation issues, so for bathrooms, let's face it, bathrooms are ideal areas for moulds to uh, thrive and grow. It's moist conditions. This is an area that requires regular attention. So if the tenant is not opening the window or using the exhaust fan, then this would fall to the tenant then to rectify, um, particularly if there's like mould on the walls or the ceilings. Um, or if there's mould um, as part of using the shower, mould on the ground. So that requires regular cleaning to keep that at bay. And that would fall to the tenant's general obligations under the Act in keeping the place clean. Um, is it just environmental factors? So as an example, again, we've got some North Queensland people joining us, so it could be that it's a wet season. In these situations, it may fall to the occupant or some negotiations may be required and give and take between both parties, depending on the area of what's been impacted. So wherever you reside in Queensland, you may or may not have that wet season. Um, and what we do know is that occupants usually um, are familiar with their area and they know how to address the mould every season and every year. So the Queensland Tenancy Laws are the Residential Tenancies and Roaming Accommodation Act. And both owners, agents and tenants have responsibilities. Both parties have also signed and agreed to the terms of their tenancy or rooming agreement, which is made up of standard and special terms. The owner needs to ensure the premises are in good condition and also carry out repairs and maintenance during the tenancy. And also too, the tenant is to keep the premises clean, having regard to the condition at the start of the tenancy. And I'm, what I'm going to do is talk about some key sections of the legislation shortly for both owners and tenants. Remember, mould is a health and safety issue and it needs to be addressed. And seriously, this is something that does need to be addressed as soon as practical. When it's not clear how the mould's got there, this is a time that you need to then turn to external professionals um, to get them to inspect and advise you of what their opinion is. Um, as I said before, getting on top of the mould early can help stop it from spreading. Um, we live in a world of websites and Google and other search engines, or you can connect to a professional company to find out what's the best way to treat the mould. And whether that's um, like clove oil or a bleach or another product, and again, check in with the professionals on what the best product is to suit your individual situation. Once identified, both parties do need to work together for a solution. And again, the best way to deal with this is within a reasonable time frame before any further damage may be caused because the mould has decided to spread. As I mentioned before, you've got plenty of information available on websites. Um, but what you've also got to is the Queensland Government also has a fact sheet on mould after a natural disaster and also what might be helpful, particularly for those maybe in the community housing um, section, is um, Department of Housing is also um, a fact sheet on mould as well for tenants. Um, before I head on to our next topic, which is going to be about maintenance, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you guys for um, your turn. What I'd like to know is um, what is the main issue you are experiencing in relation to mould? So I'll just launch that poll. Bear with me. So the main issue, is it 
tradespeople availability or getting them to respond? Um, is it gaining access to the property? Is it getting owner's instructions? Um, or is there delays or no response for repair requests that's coming through? So what I'd like to do is just hear from you for a moment in relation to um, the repair, the maintenance topic. Interesting fact that the maintenance and repairs are one of our most popular topics in our call centre and our dispute resolution service for conciliation. So we're just keen to hear from you what you feel are the main issue um, that you are seeing with this particular topic. Okay, just to give you an idea of um, the responses for this, what we have is the highest two are actually no response or delays to repair requests um, at 41%, 44%, sorry, and now also to getting owner's instructions to approve the repairs, um, sitting at 28%. So they're the um, most common um, issues that um, people are experiencing. I'll just end that poll note now. So thanks everybody. Okay, let's get on to maintenance. So let's look at some of the key sections of the legislation. Again, this is gonna probably help you a little bit too with the mould um, issue that we just went through. So the lessor's general obligations are under section 185, and they are to ensure the premises are fit and clean to live in and in good repair and, not, and the owner's not in breach of any health or safety laws. And while the tenancy continues, to ensure the repairs or maintenance issues are carried out. The tenant's general obligations fall under section 188, and they include keeping the premises and inclusions clean, um, obviously having regard to the property condition at the start of their tenancy, and also to, at the end of the tenancy, to return the premises in the same condition it was in at the start, less spare wear and tear. Tenants also do have an obligation to notify the owner or the agent about any repairs that require attention, and also to report any damage to the property. That you can find under section 217. So when we talk about maintenance versus damage, any damage caused by the tenant is for the tenant to rectify. Even if it's a guest of the tenant that's done the damage, they need to still carry out that repair or rectify the issue. These fall into the category of returning the premises in the same condition it was at the start, less fair wear and tear. Whereas with your maintenance, this can be because of an item or the property just being worn over time through the normal use or maybe through age. So let's have a look now at how a tenant can report maintenance or a repair issue. So every agent and landlord will have their own preferred method. And that may be by way of sending an email, completing a maintenance request form, um, whether that is paper-based or through a website portal, or they could be just phoning up to report the issue. It's really important that tenants have that information up front at the start of their tenancy. And keep in mind, Someone who may not necessarily be digitally savvy may not be able to use a, a portal for that particular way of reporting a repair. Or if English is not their first language, just making sure it's clear upfront on how they can actually report an item if it needs to be repaired. The Act outlines what an emergency repair is under section 214. Everything else is considered to be a routine repair. Emergency repairs, particularly any health um, or safety risks should be addressed straight away uh, for any repair notification. Even if that's a phone call, it's probably best to just follow that up in writing by way of email or message so that there's evidence of that notification. In some cases, a tenant may inform the owner or agent um, by the way of that formal notification and that's using the notice to remedy breach and that's okay. Um, or it may be because there's been no response to carrying out a repair request previously, the tenant then can start that breach process and issue the notice to remedy breach. For general tenancies, the owner or the agent will have seven days to rectify the breach. And for roomy accommodation, it's five, uh, five days um, for the general breach. So depending on the repair that you may need, you might need to be looking at referring it to industry professionals. So for example, um, licensed electricians to do electrical work, that may exclude 
changing a standard light bulb. And for plumbing, there's a difference whether you're replacing a bathroom tap washer or doing something more than that or something major requiring a qualified plumber. So in some instances, um, an owner or a handyman may be able to do some small and simple repairs that don't require licensed trades, like fixing a kitchen, uh, like a kitchen cupboard hinge or a door handle or nailing a, a paling on a fence. So, um, or it could be replacing a tap. Whereas in other situations, a licensed or qualified professional may be required. So it's not our area to say which trade can be called on for what job, and that's a case-by-case -case basis. However, remember health and safety first for the person doing the repair and also to the person who's living in the rental property as well. So all rental properties should be fitted with the safety requirements under Queensland's legislation, such as your smoke alarm laws and also your electrical safety switches. The RTA has past webinars available on our website. Um, they were done in uh, collaboration with um, Queensland Fire and Emergency Services and also the Electrical Safety Office. So if you need more information, please jump on our website for those and, and watch those. It's really good information. Uh, if repairs or the breach notice has not been rectified and you've tried to attempt self-resolution, trying to sort the problem out without success, you can apply to the RTA's free dispute resolution service where an impartial conciliator can assist you and the other party come to an agreement. And keep in mind too that if sometimes it's just times required for getting parts and or an owner may need to have time to budget to cover some costs. Consider a rent reduction or level of compensation until that item is repaired. And please make sure any of those arrangements, you've got that in writing. Okay, routine inspections. They're carried out by owners or their managing agents. And most importantly, the tenant needs to be informed before that inspection occurs and notified of the date and the time. The Act also states how many inspections can occur within a 12 month period. So for your general tenancies, it's no more than four and cannot be less than three months unless the tenant agrees. And for your roomy accommodation, for your residents, no more than once a month inspections. And again, unless the resident agrees. When an inspection occurs, the key items that the agents or the owners are looking for is that is the tenant complying with the obligations of their agreement in keeping the premises clean and tidy and not doing damage. They could also be looking to view any past repairs or current repairs or looking at any health and safety concerns. And also to looking at future maintenance, what might need to be replaced or done down the track. And this gives their owner the opportunity to budget or organise the tradespeople if that's required. So as I mentioned in the last slide, the tenant needs to be informed before the managing agent or the owner can conduct that routine inspection. So for general tenancies, that's seven days notice and for room accommodation, it's 48 hours. On the entry notice, an agent or owner may choose a specific time. And I just wanna spend a moment on this particular topic. Um, so you could say, I'm coming at 11 o'clock or they can provide a two hour window meaning that they wish to inspect, say, between 11 and 1. The entry must occur during this time. Now, the Act doesn't state or restrict how long you can be inside for the inspection. It just talks about when the actual entry occurs. So if I look at the scenario of a two-hour window of 11 to 1, I could say enter at 11 o'clock, 11.30, or I could even still enter at five minutes to 1, and that would be still okay. Can I enter before 11 o'clock? No. Can I enter if it's after one o'clock? No. So just to be clear, you cannot send out notifications saying that the inspection is going to be between nine and five. It needs to be either a specified time or that two hour window. So some of the other questions that we're often asked, are: what happens if the tenant's not at home? So if the entry notice has been issued in accordance to the Act and it's correct, then you can still enter. And as always, ensure the premises are secured when you leave. And what happens if the tenant refuses access? If you've followed the rules as a manager or a landlord, you are entitled to enter. However, there may be reasons why the tenant is stopping that inspection. 
Um, and it could be someone sick inside, um, like recovering from an illness or other health issues. Are they a shift worker and they sleep during the day? Or they may be concerned for um, an approved pet not being secured and escaping. So tenants and owners, managers need to all work together, be open and honest and renegotiate another date and time for the entry to occur if you have to. Again, if you're unable to negotiate another entry, then again, the RTA's free dispute resolution service may be able to assist you um, to get the matter resolved. And I know that Valentina has just sent um, a chat before, but Kay, don't forget guys, if you do have any questions, please use that little chat function and submit your questions because we do, we'd love to actually hear from you. Okay, let's get to photos. And this is sort of like probably one of the other topics that's coming up recently as well. We often get questions about like taking photos. So I'm not going to talk today about taking the photos for advertising purposes. So remember there's rules for that along with penalty units for non-compliance. So what we want to talk about now is more about your photos that might be taken as part of your routine inspections. So that you need to keep in mind the purpose of the photos versus the tenant's privacy. So in some instances, it is a bit of a gray area, noting that the Act doesn't state whether you can or cannot take photos during a routine inspection. Um, if photos are being taken, I would see that it's been a courtesy to actually inform the tenant. We know that agents um, and managing parties do take photos as part of their reporting process in your routine inspections. However, I guess the questions that we need to be asking when photos are taken is, why is it being taken? And more importantly, what is in that photo? You do want to make sure that any identifying items, such as like your family photos or personal documents, vehicle registration numbers even, making sure that that's not in the photos. Remember, while it's the owner's property, it is still the tenant's home, and you may not be aware of any other personal situations that might be happening. And that could include maybe a DFE situation. So please, if there's any concerns, we're encouraging tenants and their managing agents to have those conversations. So other questions to ask yourself is who is going to be seeing that photo? Importantly, how will the photo be stored? So let's look at some practical terms on this. Um, photos of every furniture item of the tenant, personal items, bedrooms, and every room in the property being taken, would that be deemed to be okay? Hmm. Versus a few photos taken demonstrating the property condition, maybe it includes a repair item or future maintenance item, some wear on the carpet, or that there's a future replacement um, that needs to be addressed or an external photo. So note that the Act doesn't state photos can't be taken in this situation. However, this is why we are asking you to look at the who, what, why, and how of the photos. And for again, both sides, the tenant and the managing party to communicate with each other. So before I go on to the next topic, I just want to quickly touch base on the rules of entry, um, as it applies to both your routine inspections and also to your maintenance. So just making sure that you give correct notice on your entry notice and the appropriate reason for your entry. The legislation outlines timeframes required. And remember, if it is an emergency situation and say the property is at risk, you can enter without notice. Otherwise, your managers and owners, please make sure that you do know the timeframes and the rules on entry. Keep a copy and of your notices. And if you have any, if you have mutual agreement, make sure you keep a note, a record or an email of what's been agreed, just in case, again, there's that loss of memory down the track. And always review any Queensland health updates on any restrictions and follow the health directives. And that may be including wearing masks, social distancing, number of people allowed. Remember the health and safety should always be a priority. Um, and everyone, owners, managers and tenants, you need to follow the Queensland health directives. As we know, um, this can change and depending on the situation across Queensland, so, and where you live, it can always um, change in a heartbeat. So always keep yourself up to date. Okay, at the time um, of our webinar today, like we know that storm season's just around the corner or for some of us, 
if you're on the east coast or in southeast Queensland or the southern part of Queensland, we know that it actually probably has hit in the last week. So this is just a reminder to get ready for when the storm season or the natural disasters may occur. So it's a reminder for both owners of rental properties and tenants to be prepared. So for owners, that means like you're clearing of your gutters, cutting back tree branches, um, or checking any window leaks, any um, leaks and stuff like that. So for tenants, gearing that up to be expecting those summer storms in the afternoon, making sure that you know the outdoor furniture or your play equipment's secured, and also to making sure that the owner or manager's um, informed of any repairs early making sure that you check your insurance policies. And this is not just for the owners for their property, but obviously too for tenants, making sure that you have a current contents of policy and also to where to get that information if you need it in a hurry. Make sure you have handy any emergency contact details and who to contact should something happen. So last year, the RTA in collaboration with QRA did a webinar with um, Get Ready Queensland. Um, you can find that on the RTA's website fantastic useful tips on what you need to do and what you need to have in case of a natural disaster. And as I said, I know we've mentioning storm season, but we all know that depending on where you live in Queensland, it could be being prepared for bushfire, flooding or cyclones. Um, yeah, we all know to be prepared, they tell us that, but how many really, how many of us really are actually prepared? So take the time to view the Get Ready Queensland website, link is available there on your screen. Okay, just some upcoming education. So in just under two weeks, we'll be in Cairns for our face-to-face -face session. So this is an event that was um, postponed from March due to um, the COVID-19 lockdown at the time. So if you are in that region, please grab some information off our website and register. Uh, make sure you have signed up for our e-news so we can keep you informed, not just on key topics, but any legislation changes. And if you know of other people who would benefit in signing up, please let them know and um, go to our, web, our website to register. We do produce various educational resources, including webinars on tenancy legislation and key topics, as well as our Talking Tenancy podcast series. So again, accessing that through our website or for your podcast through your preferred app. Now, Valentine, I know that you've been sitting there um, quietly, so let's go to your questions. Again, if you still have a question, please use the um, chat function in your toolbar and um, we will get to your question. So over to you, Valentina, come online for me and let's look at some of these questions that's come through. Okay. I can see one that's come from Tim that seems to be a very long question. Um. Okay, what we have, Tim, Tim has a question about mould, uh, Lynn, and what he wants to know is what if the tenant's taken as many precautions as possible uh, to stop minor mould and professional contractors have completed mould tests and air tests and it's found that humidity is very low, no leaks, just minor mould on ceiling corners from general humidity regarding showers. Is the general cleaning of the mould the tenant's responsibility for just general cleaning? Um, it's a good question, Tim. Thanks for that. Um, if you've got the professional contractors in and they've said that it's just general um, as what would normally happen in a bathroom situation, then it would then obviously fall to the tenant because, you know, you've got to make sure that they're obviously keeping the windows open or the exhaust fans on. It would fall to the tenant as part of their um, normal use. However, where there's probably some issues, and this is where really good negotiations coming in in relation to the owners and the tenants, if you're looking at really, really high ceilings that you know, are really hard to get to or something like that, that may require some assistance for the tenant to, um, or by the owner to actually get that fixed. Um, or if the professionals have come back in and said, look, there's some other issues at play here, um, then the owner might come in there and just um, negotiate this and maybe look involved in getting, being involved in actually doing the cleaning or getting someone else in to do that cleaning. So I think it's really important to make sure that any mould is dealt with quickly um, and looked at straight away. So again, whether it's reporting, if the tent's reported the issue, 
um, or getting in as part of your routine inspection and getting on top of it first before it actually does spread. So it's a little bit of a, um, a tricky question there. As I said, I will be guided by what your professional contractors are saying, Tim, whether if it's found to be, you know, there needs to be more ventilation, well, then that might come back to the owner. Or if it's deemed to be reasonable, then again, coming back to the tenant. Next one, Valentina. Okay. Um, we have a few questions here, Lynn, about inspections, but uh, Diana's got one about, well, both inspection and uh, the taking of photos. So is the real estate allowed to use photos taken during my routine inspection um, for property sale advertising without my consent? Uh, quick answer to that, Diana, is no. So any photos that's taken, whether it's been done through um, your routine inspection, if the purpose of those photos is then to be shared for when the property has been promoted for sale, then they need um, the tenant's written consent um, before they can do that. And just keeping in mind on that particular topic, um, that actually does have penalty units attached to it. And that's something that our investigations team would look at because the Act is very clear that if photos are being taken for the use of advertising, um, then they do need the owner's, uh, the tenant's permission for that. Okay, how are you going yeah. there, Veen? What's your next oh, there's, one? There's quite a, quite a few questions here about inspections. So uh, Sharon's asked, uh, in regards to inspections for exits, uh, do we give the tenant the opportunity to come back to rectify cleaning issue after they have handed the keys back. Okay, Sharon, probably a little bit outside our scope for today, but um, in relation to the exit condition report, this is where the tenant's responsibility is to return the property back in the same condition it was at the start of the tenancy, less fair wear and tear. And what we know is um, there's nothing actually in our act that talks about giving the tent the opportunity to go back and rectify any cleaning or anything like that. But what we do know is probably what the industry has seen over the years. Previously, there was a code of conduct um, for real estate agents that allowed for that situation to occur. We know that some magistrates look at whether a tenant has been given an opportunity or know that there's some issues. So it's probably whether um, it's that really good communication. Again, coming back at the end of the tenancy to go, if you do wish to give the tenant an opportunity, and look, we've seen people, yes, give opportunities, no give opportunities. The opportunities could be that they give them, you know, 12 hours, 24 hours to rectify whatever might need to be done. That's actually up to probably your business practice. As I said, our act doesn't actually state that you do have to do that. However, what we are seeing and hearing is some of the some of the adjudicators may look to ask those questions. Were the tenant informed that there was issues? Did they get an opportunity to fix anything? So again, not black and white, not in our legislation to say that specifically, um, but something that you may do and you may find that um, quite a few people do talk to the tenants afterwards, and which is what we do encourage and have those conversations about whether they can go back and rectify it or whether that you're going to get someone to fix up any issues. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Lynn. We have uh, another question from uh, Susan uh, to do with, with inspections. What if the owner has not seen the property for some time due to living interstate and COVID restrictions? Can WhatsApp uh, be used for um, or something similar be used for an inspection? Um, look, we do find, yeah. obviously, we're in a, a, a different environment these days. Um, this is where again comes down to who's viewing that in who's viewing the photos and things like that. And while we understand people are living interstate overseas and cannot inspect, just making sure that it's a secure channel to um, be sharing those photos, I think was probably more the um, situation. Um, just making sure that um, it's not being you know worldly shared unless the tenant obviously is okay with that. Um, but again, just letting the tenant know that um, that there will be an avenue that their photos will be shared to as part of the reporting. But 
again, nothing to stop the um, particular apps or other things being used. But again, we ask those, ask those questions as who, what, why, and how questions, and particularly who's viewing it, um, and also to um, how it's being stored. Um, I have seen and I've heard of a case previously where um, someone's routine inspections have ended up on YouTube. Um, I don't think that would be a smart move because that would um, obviously be breaching someone's privacy big time. So just be very mindful of what channels you are using. Thanks, Lynn. Um, Natasha would also like to know, has the tenant the right to ask for change of time or date of entry if they can't be present and do not feel comfortable to have their home be entered into in their absence? Um, Look, I suppose, Natasha, from that point of view, it's not necessarily about a right. I mean, the, our Act's very clear that if the inspection note, if the entry notices have been served correctly, then you do have a right to enter. However, if someone is coming back to you to say, I don't feel comfortable, or there's a specific reason why that um, the entry is um, not going to be able to occur, then that's that negotiation and talking to them. And maybe it's just asking them about why they may not feel comfortable. And it may be that they've had a bad experience previously. It could be that someone, they, they're not feeling trust that you will secure the place um, or that you know, something else might be happening um, that they would like to be present. Um, I know it's, that's why we're, there's also that two hour window that's been put in place. Um, to allow people that opportunity um, to, you know, be a bit flexible for the time if someone is running late. Um, as I said, it's not really a black and white answer there for you, Natasha, but it's about negotiating and working through if someone does need to renegotiate another date or time. Uh, Lynn, um, thank you for that. Rachel has a question that sort of touches very similarly on, on the same topic and what she wanted uh, to know was uh, if if they have tried to accommodate a, a tenant and what she's saying is uh, they do have tenants where she is that uh, regularly will uh, want to reschedule a routine in inspection and they do try and accommodate them but if after a few times it still isn't suitable can they insist on entry provided we have issued the correct notice, she says. Yeah, and as I said, that probably goes back to how, Rachel, of how I've actually answered mm. Natasha's um, previous, previous question. Um, look, if you've tried and you've done two or three times to negotiate, I think it's about having that conversation with the tenant um, and just, you know, really probably saying, look, the Act actually allows it. And referred back to the sections of the Act um, 192 to 199, where it's very clear that you have a right to enter for these particular purpose um, or reasons. And this is a notice that you're entitled to, um, do, um, to provide to the tenant. The other part, what you can do is if you're not getting anywhere with the tenant is stop and come through our RTA's free dispute resolution service and see if we can try and assist you with getting um, a set date and time and making it happen for you. Uh, Rosalie has said uh, that she did. She she has done something similar to what you suggested, Lynn. That she sent RTA information about the act, and then the tenant yeah. understood. Hmm. Yeah, and look, you know, sometimes um, taking a copy of um, those few pages from the act um, with the copy of your entry notice, if you do have someone standing at the door saying, "No, you shall not pass. You can't come in." Um, just maybe showing those particular sections of the Act and going, hey, I am entitled to come in. But again, also to checking that if there might be a specific reason why the entry is not occurring, but being very firm in relation to the Act actually does allow you to gain entry. One more question, Lynn, thank you for that. Uh, I'm just looking question. at the time, Valentina, so yes, we better just do one more. Hmm. And uh, well, we, we only have the one more there and I think we're just on time. Uh, Joanne would like to know, what's the RTA stand um, if you want access to a property for maintenance inspection? A routine inspection has already been completed, but owner wants further investigation. What notice is required to give to the tenant? 
Okay, so probably this really comes back, Joanne, in relation to the purpose of entry. So if it is to carry out a maintenance or repair issue, then you're allowed to do that. If it's in relation to you've done a routine inspection, but you want to be going back in and do a little bit more on that routine inspection, the best probably way is to have a conversation with the tenant and gain entry by way of mutual agreement. Um, that's probably the quickest and easiest way um, to gain that entry after an inspection's occurred. Okay, Thank V, you. I think we've, um, we've done all the questions. Look, thanks everybody for your time this morning. Um, I think we've, um, yeah, we've covered everyone, haven't we, Valentina? Yes. We have covered everyone. Thank you everyone for your questions. Yeah. Um, look, again, the RTA's website, we've got a lot of information, all our forms and resources available at rta.qld.gov.au. But please remember to, when you're using our forms, just make sure you're using the latest versions of our forms and you're downloading that from our website. Um, our web services on all things bonds, you can access 24 hours, seven days a week through our web service. Um, or if you've got any direct questions, please contact our call centre on 1300 366 311. We're here Monday to Friday, 8.30am to 5pm. Again, remember that survey is about to come up when the webinar closes. So please take this opportunity to provide us with some feedback and more importantly on the topics that you want to know more about. Um, the surveys, look, it doesn't even take a minute, I'm sure of it. Um, so please let me know what topics are of interest for you. So thank you again for joining me today and I look forward to you joining me next time um, and a copy of the recording will be available on our website next week. So the webinar will now close. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye bye.